All right, let's bring in our think tank night, uh, think tank tonight. Joining us in Atlanta, uh, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon in the Bronx, New York, criminal defense attorney Renee Hill, and in New York, New York, trial attorney, former prosecutor Imran Ansari, also a Court TV alum. Welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, Michael, let me start with you. Um, what's it like when you're the attorney in the courtroom and you know it's something that you said that kind of set the judge off at the end of the day? What's that like? Uh, hopefully it's at the end of the day rather than while the trial is still going on. I mean, look, you know, trials are long, they're complex, it can be frustrating. And especially when you have two sides that are sort of bickering back and forth and back and forth, it's going to set a judge off. Um, like it's totally understandable. Uh, the judge is a person up there, and at the end of the day, he does have to go home. I think, uh, like I said earlier, it's good that it's at the end of the day, so at least people have an opportunity to, to cool off and come back in tomorrow, the next day, and sort of recollect themselves. But yeah, I mean, absolutely, it can be frustrating. Uh, Renee Hill, um, there it, it came out there that there are like ten or maybe twelve prosecutors on this case, and one defense attorney with his associate who sits behind him, and, and I'm sure she helps, but it's really Eric Nelson. What are your thoughts about, as we get ready for this trial, that you got a team of 12 against a team of, like, one or one plus a, a helper? Well, you know, it, the government, the prosecutors, they always have a team. They have the resources. They have it all. And you have to wonder if the jurors are going to find sympathy for the defense because they see all of these people working for the prosecution and then they see the defendant and they see his attorney by himself. And that's something that you, you know, might consider is going to filter into their minds. The judge may uh, speak to the jurors about that and say, don't let that play into any of your decision making in this case. But it is something that the jurors are obviously going to observe. And they're going to see that. And, you know, the defense attorney, Mr. Nelson, he, he might play upon that a little bit. If there's any way that he can in any sort of theatrics, he may use that to his advantage. Kind of like the, the, the Columbo routine. I've seen that. Yeah. I've, seen, I've seen it be very <laughs> effective, by the way. Uh, Imran, I've got, I've got a completely different question for you. And it has to do with this civil settlement, record-setting settlement of $27 million. And the city attorney said today, well, we didn't know if that deal would be there in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, or eight weeks. And I was like, really? Like, after this trial, if, if, if you still offered the family $27 million, they would say, no, we want to go to trial and, and maybe, maybe win more money because uh, Romanucci, their attorney, has gotten bigger uh, awards than that. Um, or maybe get nothing and... and in a civil case, when would you get paid? Like two, three, four, five years down the road? I mean, do you think that was, uh, um, do you think he was being 100% truthful there? Vinny, I think the uh, timing of this announcement has us all scratching our heads saying, why now? Right in the process of what's probably one of the most difficult uh, jury selection process in any trial in recent history. Uh, because of the polarization you have in, in the country and the strong opinions. It's uh, already an uphill battle to get a fair and impartial jury uh, in this case. And here you have uh, the city of Minneapolis coming out and toting this $27 million settlement um, right in the middle of jury selection. So I don't think he's being completely forthright. I think he's being guarded in what he's telling us. You know, you have the Judge Cahill giving the instructions, say, don't discuss this settlement, but it seems like everyone is still discussing the settlement. But we see the ramifications of this announcement in jury selection. We have two jurors who got knocked off. Uh, you still have today um, a discussion about this uh, settlement. And you have these press, uh, and I understand that the city wants to be transparent. They want the uh, public to be informed. But you have to be guarded and guided by um, what you're going to put out there. So the timing of this, you know, he's being very guarded about what he's saying now. But keep in mind, Vinny, they had a press conference, a press conference, which was uh, definitely prepared, organized, where this $27, $27 million settlement uh, was put out there. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's something that the court's going to have to deal with. And I think it makes the jury selection process all the more difficult in a case that was already uh, having difficulties in, in terms of getting a fair and impartial jury. Yeah. And I, and I don't fault uh, the, the plaintiffs, George Ford, George Floyd's family or their attorneys for settling the case. If they're going to put $27 million on the table um, and you get a, 
a guarantee of justice that, yes, someone is saying that, that George Floyd was wrongfully uh, killed and someone is being held responsible. I understand that, and I agree 100% with what they did. My, my question is on the, on the city's side of all this, because it does create a potential issue down the road and a potential issue immediately as well. But I think they're going to get through it because we're going to go back to the good news when we come back, which is the fact that we are up to 12 jurors now in this case. And we're going to talk about the three who were added today, all women. That's next. Being a nurse, right, do you think that you would view that type of evidence differently than an average citizen? Probably. Someone who doesn't have medical training. How do, you, how do you think your professional background impacts or influences how you may look at video evidence or medical evidence? Um. You know, re I recognize the amount of time that a person can be without air before they're unconscious. Mm -hmm. That is Juror 89, who is now seated in the final panel here in the case uh, against Derek Chauvin. I mean, she's one of the 12 who will determine whether or not George Floyd was murdered by Chauvin. Uh, here's some more on Juror 89. Um, a woman, white, in her 50s. She's a cardiac care nurse, has not watched the entire video of George Floyd's death, and has not formed an opinion on cause of death or who is responsible. Renee Hill, who's liking uh, Juror 89 more, you think, prosecution or defense? Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of split down the middle. The defense what? Likes a her fair and impartial juror? What? Are you absolutely, kidding me? Absolutely. But the defense likes her because... They are going to be arguing the cause of death. I mean, what the cause of death here is. And so they want someone that they can, you know, try to impress upon what the actual cause of death is here. It's at the same time, the prosecution is looking at the same thing. And they believe a cardiac nurse, in my opinion, they believe that a cardiac nurse is going to see what exactly was going on here. She's going to be able to look at the length of time that the knee was on the neck, that his neck was being compressed, and how that would affect his ability to breathe and result in his death. All right, that's one juror who passed through today. Let's take a listen to Juror 91. The statement is, there is a statement that reads, discrimination is not as bad as the media makes it out to be and you circled no opinion. Why did you circle no opinion? Because I just don't know, or what I do know of the media, which is very little, I know that the media can exaggerate things or it can downplay things. And so I don't know. OK. Um, there is a statement that reads, blacks and other minorities do not receive equal treatment as whites in the criminal justice system. And you somewhat agreed with that? Somewhat. Why? Um, once again, just what the media portrays. Um, just for an example, um, with this resurrection, there were some people that, you know, of course, were arrested. And I think I saw that someone was given permission to go on vacation, as opposed to, you know, let, let them out of jail to go on vacation. And I just kind of wondered, hmm, who gets to do that? OK. Yeah. Um, you're, are you talking about kind of what happened at the Capitol? Exactly. In right, Washington? right at the Capitol, yes. yes. Okay. So. And someone was released. I, did, I, haven't heard, I, I haven't been paying attention to the news <laughs> of late. Uh, someone was released and allowed to go on vacation? I believe so. And I'm presuming that person was white? I believe so, yes. And you don't think that other uh, minorities would get that same treatment? Mm. Some may. Okay. Do you think it's more economic driven versus, or is it more racial, racially driven? I think it's probably more economic driven. All right, let's take a look more about Juror 91, a, a black woman in her 60s. She's a grandma. Uh, her relative works for the Minneapolis Police Department. 
saw news of the $27 million settlement and saw some of uh, the video of George Floyd's death. Uh, Imran, I know if the media was on trial, I would dismiss her immediately, but uh, it's not the media that's on trial. So is it the prosecution or defense, you think, here that is more excited about Juror 91? Vinny, I actually think this is a, a very good example of a potential fair and impartial juror, which is why I think uh, she ended up on this jury. I mean, she has in her pedigree, if you will, she has a relative who works with the Minneapolis uh, Police Department. She's acknowledging disparities in the justice system, which I think a lot of people have to accept and acknowledge, but she's not necessarily showing opinions so strong that you would think that if she was seated on the jury, she would not be able to be fair and impartial. So I think she's giving all the right answers. She's showing that she's a thinking person. And, you know, jurors are not robots. They're people. They bring their life experiences to the jury. They bring their common sense uh, and the things that they have seen uh, in their lives to the jury. And you want a juror like that. You just don't want a juror who's going to be so uh, on one side that they can't give both sides a fair shake. I think this is a juror which is a potentially a perfect juror, if you will, or, or one that was is likely to be fair and impartial and to do her job as she is expected to uh, as a juror on this case. Yeah, it, it, I agree with you. Uh, now let's take a listen to Juror 92. Police in my community make me feel safe, and you strongly agreed with that statement? Yeah, I've just had a few instances I've called where either, you know, something minor happened at my place and they arrived in a quick manner and professional and yeah. made you feel safe. Correct. Right? All right. She's been accepted as a juror as well. She's a white woman, has not seen the full video of George Floyd's death and strongly disagrees with defunding the police. Michael Bixon, who is uh, more so excited about 92? That uh, sounds very defense friendly, and that's weird to hear somebody very, very pro police, and at the same time, you would consider that very defense friendly. But in this case, it definitely is. Um, and you hear talking about, you know, uh, defending the police is bad, and and her statements about them responding to the incident. For this case in particular, yes, I think she is going to be very defense friendly. So if I was the defense attorney, I'd be all for her. All right, three women. Now we've got seven women, five men on this jury. The women back in charge. All right, uh, folks, the latest episode of the Court TV podcast is now available. We're covering, of course, the death of George Floyd murder trial. A record $27 million settlement has been reached between the city of Minneapolis and the family of George Floyd. But why was the announcement made in the middle of jury selection? And what impact could that have on all of this? Michael Ayala and I discussed the ramifications this could have on jury selection. They'll never get a fair jury. How many times have I heard that? It's usually the defendant who's saying you can't get a fair trial because, you know, it's just too high profile. Everyone's talked about it. People like me have been blabbing on about it. And then every time I've got to roll out the list of high profile cases that Court TV has covered through the years and the verdicts related to those cases, you know, whether you begin with O.J. Simpson, okay, not guilty. George Zimmerman, oh, he'll never get a fair jury. They, they've already convicted him. And they didn't convict him at trial. So he was found not guilty as well. Uh, and some people do get convicted. Jody Arias got convicted. But ultimately, it comes down to what happens inside the courtroom. You can find the Court TV podcast wherever you listen, and it's always available on CourtTV.com. And yes, I let Michael Ayala speak as well. We'll be right back. Today in the death of George Floyd murder trial, three more jurors were seated and Court TV cameras are inside the courtroom. And tomorrow morning when court resumes, we'll bring you live coverage of every minute of jury selection, plus three big decisions that the judge will be ruling on first thing in the morning. So make sure you tune in. Right now, though, we're taking you on the docket for the Playboy model murder trial out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Ted Rollins has the story. Renowned psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Burchard had been missing for three days when his body was found in the trunk of an abandoned BMW in the desert outside of Las Vegas. Judy Earp, his girlfriend of 17 years, was back at their home in California and sensed the doctor was in trouble. Uh, I told him repeatedly that these are not, you know, the people, you, the kind of people you want to be associating with. 
Judy was worried about this woman, 25-year-old playboy and Maxim model Kelsey Turner. Judy says Kelsey was extorting money from Dr. Burchard. About 300000 that I know about and possibly more. Burchard had a history of helping others and engaging with young, attractive girls he met online like Kelsey. That's according to his friend who did not want to be identified when he was interviewed by KSBW. These women were just like an escape for him to, to, to have somewhere to go. He told me he met Kelsey on a website and uh, met up with her and, and they talked and they went and had dinner a few times. Dr. Burchard's friend says the psychiatrist started spending time and money on Kelsey, even renting this condo in Salinas, California for Kelsey and her mother to live along with Kelsey's child. Even after Dr. Burchard stopped paying the rent and Kelsey moved to Vegas, the two did keep in contact. And shortly before the murder, Kelsey reached out to the doctor, according to his friend. He says, seems, seems that Kelsey's having some trouble with her boyfriend out there in Vegas. Um, he's hitting her, he's um, abusing her, and she has no money, nowhere to go. And I feel partly responsible for this. Court documents show that Kelsey Turner was, in fact, reported as the victim in a domestic violence case less than a month before the doctor's murder. Dr. Burchard went to Vegas to see Kelsey, calling his girlfriend Judy only after he had arrived, saying he was spending the weekend and would be back on Monday. I warned him on Saturday when he was there that, you know, maybe you ought not wait till Monday to come home. Maybe you ought to just come home on the next flight. After missing his flight and not responding to calls and texts, Judy called Las Vegas police. Dr. Burchard's body was found near Lake Mead, about 25 miles outside Vegas. The actual incident occurred at a residence in the Las Vegas Valley, and then the body was found out by the lake. This is the Las Vegas home where Kelsey and her boyfriend, John Kennison, were living and where investigators believe Dr. Burchard was murdered. Kelsey's roommate, Diana Pena, told a grand jury that Kennison attacked Dr. Burchard with a baseball bat and that after the initial attack, Kelsey insisted that her boyfriend knock him out. Pena also testified that the attack left Kennison covered in blood. According to arrest warrants, police recovered a bag from the Rio Hotel. It's where prosecutors say Turner, Kennison, and Pena fled to after the murder. Inside that bag, investigators found sheets of paper ripped from Dr. Burchard's notebook that contained his banking information and passwords. Uh, additional information has come to light. Kelsey Turner was arrested in California three weeks after police recovered Burchard's body. Her extradition was delayed after it was determined that she was pregnant. She has since given birth to a girl while in custody. Her boyfriend, John Kennison, was arrested a few weeks later in Las Vegas. Both are facing murder charges. Kelsey's roommate, Diana Pena, pleaded guilty to accessory to murder and is expected to testify at their trials. What a case. What a trial. Let's bring back in our think tank tonight. Still with us, uh, Michael Bixon and Renee Hill, criminal defense attorneys and trial attorney, former prosecutor Imran Ansari. Imran, I'll start with you. Um, the doctor and his money, is that a, a motive to kill him or a motive to keep him alive for Kelsey Turner? Well, I think uh, Kelsey Turner's attorney is going to be uh, making an argument, most likely, that uh, the doctor was worth more to Kelsey Turner alive rather than dead. So therefore, um, she is not guilty uh, of this murder. Um, the state, on the other hand, would most likely is going to be making the argument that all the evidence showed that money was the motive. Money was the motive uh, uh, for the alleged murder. And we hear about that bag that's found in the hotel room, which has uh, the ripped out papers with his various passwords and whatnot to financial institutions. So um, the defense, he's worth more, al uh, more alive to Kelsey Turner. The prosecution, money was a motive, and that's why uh, they uh, committed the alleged crime. Michael, Judy Earp, uh, the longtime girlfriend of the doctor, you know, her, her, her intuition was, was right on. Uh, what, what role does she play in this trial? I think she's got a couple different roles. Um, she can certainly testify to what kind of person the doctor was about. Um, you know, who he was as a person, I think matters to the jury. They want to know, uh, who the victim was when they're contemplating 
the fate in this case. I think that she can also certainly testify as to the relationship between the doctor and the defendants in this situation, because like she it does sound as though she had some knowledge about them. Now, how far that goes, I think obviously we're gonna have to wait till the trial, which I do think this is certainly going to go to. But yeah, I, I do think that she's got a lot to testify about in this case. You know, the other relationships I'm, I'm fascinated by here and don't quite understand what was going on, Renee, is um, Diana Pena, Kelsey Turner, and Kelsey's boyfriend, John Tennyson. Um, she's now going to be the star witness for prosecutors, but all three of them are, I, I, I guess, living together. I, I don't quite understand what was going on there. Uh, how, yeah. how important will it be for this jury to understand their relationship? Well, it's going to be very important for the jury to understand their relationship because she is the key witness for the prosecution. And so her involvement with this couple, her knowledge of what took place and, and, you know, on the date of the death is going to be very important to this jury. So they're going to want to know, is she good friends with the roommate? Is she good friends with the boyfriend? What was their relationship with each other? Were they arguing at the time? Because now she's coming in, providing testimony against them, conceivably trying to save herself from, um, you know, a great penalty here. And she's going to be giving the prosecution what they need to secure convictions in this case. Yeah. You know, when I, when I think of this case, uh, to me, venue means a lot and, and jurisdiction. I mean, if you took this story and put it in some other parts of this country, the jury might be a little bit shocked or taken back by the Playboy Maxim model with the older doctor and everything else going on. But this, this trial is going to be in Vegas, Michael. I, I think they, they've heard this story before. I, I can imagine that a Vegas jury has seen a thing or two. Um, I've never tried a case in Vegas. Uh, I'd certainly be uh, interested to see how the jurors would react to something this extreme. And, I mean, this case has got it all in terms of uh, what you would look for, like a newsworthy case, obviously. Um, but still, I, I think this case is definitely a, a head above shoulders for the rest. All right, folks, we're tracking this one, and we've got a, a status check to reset the trial on June 4th. So my guess is on June 4th, they will set the trial date, and this thing is ripe to go. It was going to go last year before the COVID shutdown, so my guess is uh, it should happen in 2021. When we come back, we'll hear from you, the 13th juror, uh, as we get ready for opening statements uh, to begin soon, March 29th, in the case against Derek Chauvin. I was asking you, what do you think the most important piece of evidence will be? Your verdict next. I've already signaled that I'm considering allowing the May 6, 2019 case limited, for example, to the officer's approach of the car, Mr. Floyd eating drugs, and then subsequent to that, being examined by a paramedic and his, uh, the indication that Mr. Floyd was in a hypertensive emergency with a, a systolic blood pressure over 200. If I grant your motion and allow Dr. Vincent to testify as to, you know, claustrophobia, anxiety, panic attacks, have these results uh, or manifestations, and that they include shortness of breath, essentially giving the state reason to argue that the jury should infer that it was a genuine anxiety response, not active resisting. Don't I also have to then allow the defense to talk about the May 6th, the similar thing, not just the contact, eating the drugs, and then fast forward to the paramedics treatment, but actually allow everything they want, which is what he was saying, how he was emotional, don't you think that if I give that to you, I have to also allow the defense to do that? And the judge there uh, talking about what evidence is coming in and what evidence will be kept out. And I asked you today, what do you think is going to be the most important evidence in the case against Eric Chauvin? And we begin with our 13th juror comment of the day coming from Keith, who says the most important evidence will be the autopsy reports and the infamous video. The jury will have to decide what a reasonable person would extrapolate. I don't see Chauvin testifying here unless he insists on it. I agree with you there, Keith. But I asked you for the most important, and Keith gave us two. So, Renee, 
You now have to decide, is it the autopsy reports or the infamous video? Which is the most important piece of evidence? I think the most important piece of evidence is going to be the autopsy report. Everyone has seen the, the video. The video is heinous. You know, that's going to pull at their heartstrings. But it's going to come down to the autopsy report and what the experts say was the cause of death. Fascinating. August tonight. The video with an exclamation point. Without it, we would not be having this conversation. Imran, let's do a hypothetical here. What if there was no one there, right? There were no bystanders. There was no video. Would there be a case? Would there be a trial? Would any of this happen? Yeah, Vinny, I, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, before the advent of everyone having their, uh, you know, a smartphone with cameras, it's totally changed the dynamic uh, of the way, uh, you know, the justice system is playing out and the way law enforcement are, are being held accountable for their actions during an arrest. Would we have a case? I don't know. I don't know if this would have been sort of hush hushed and brushed aside by PD. Um, but, you know, we do have a video. And I think that that is the best evidence in this case and a piece of evidence that's going to be played out time and time again in the courtroom uh, by the prosecution and also by the defense. Jeremiah tonight, it will be the multiple videos of all of his arrests and him fighting the police saying he can't breathe in all of them and the toxicology reports from all of them. Well, again, Jeremiah, you picked two things here. Uh, uh, but I think the point that Jeremiah is making here, Michael, is referencing what the judge was talking about on the way in, which is that 2019 arrest. It looks like part of that information will get in front of this jury. How powerful will that be? How important will it be? Oh, I mean, I think it's going to change everything. If they get that in, it's going to influence the jurors to no end. If they hear about the similar circumstances between the two and the different results between the two, I think that's going to solidify their opinions, and I think it could make or break this case. All right, karma tonight. I think for the evidence, I believe it would be the cause of death. And, Renee, that's exactly what you said, right? Because it comes down to the, the autopsy, and, and that's all about cause of death here. How do you think the battle yeah. of experts is going to play here? Well, <laughs> it's going to be very interesting, Vinny, because... You're going to have the prosecutor's experts that are going to come in and say it was asphyxiation. You're going to have the defense experts come in and say it was it was because of whatever he ingested, as well as any other preconditions that he had. And if the defense has the uh, the ability to bring in that prior case, they're going to use his behavior and what his uh, health conditions were back then to bolster their case. So it's going to come down to the experts. Um, who they believe, who they find to be more credible in this case, along with what they actually see in the video. Lisa, tonight, I think the most important part of the evidence is for the government to prove Derek Chauvin singled George Floyd out. If they have to prove it was intentional, it's probably going to be a wrap. All right. Imran, um, the intent here. We believe there's still going to be an argument about what the jury instruction is going to be, but we believe uh, the only level of intent prosecutors may have to prove here is the intentional infliction of bodily harm by Chauvin for second degree murder. How much of a challenge is that in this case? Vinny, I actually think it is going to be challenging uh, for the prosecution to show the intent. I mean, we have. The video, again, the video, the best evidence where you have uh, Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck. I think they're going to be pointing to that. They're going to be pointing to the length of time that George Floyd is on the ground with Derek Chauvin's uh, knee on his neck. And they will be arguing that that is the intent. He had the intent to cause him this uh, bodily harm and to cause the death. If they're going to go for that top count, uh, Vinny, that's what they're going to have to show. And I think they're going to be looking to that piece of evidence, that part of the video, to prove it. Sandra, hopefully the entire video will be shown. Uh, Michael Bixon, there is one juror who has not seen the video, and there are many others who have only seen parts of the video. What do you think it's going to be like inside that courtroom the first time that video is played from start to finish? 
It's pretty common where nowadays that everyone's recording stuff, you see only clips, uh, and, and obviously people are going to see different parts of the video. I think to see the full video, though, from beginning to end is really going to be the deciding factor in this case. I personally think the video tells the story, and that's what both, I think, arguably, the defense and prosecution need to do to develop their own story. But they're both going to take this video and sort of take their own spins on it. I think for the jurors, though, ultimately, this is going to be the decision maker uh, in terms of, you know, how they how they vote. Jacqueline, the really big white thing allegedly in Floyd's mouth after he was out into the police car that he could not have possibly swallowed nor talked with it in there. And this is going to be the allegation by the defense that he had fentanyl and ingested it as police approached him. Renee Hill, we have like 10 seconds. Is that a big issue here? Um, I, I don't think it's a big issue here. I mean, it, it goes to, again, the defense arguing that he ingested something and that went towards, uh, you know, what was happening with him and that that's what caused his death. But, you know, it's, it's not going to be, that's not going to be the major part of the evidence here. Renee Hill, Michael Bixon, Imran Asari, thank you all so much. Appreciate your time and your expertise. Come back soon. That's it for me. Make sure you're here first thing in the morning. Big decisions by the judge. In the meantime, I'm Vinny Politan. Have a great night. Don't forget to hug the kids.